thank you for the introduction. I am an assistant professor in mechanical engineering. I'm the co-director of the Northwest National Marine Renewable Energy Center, which is a DOE-funded venture between Oregon State University and the University of Washington, uh, looking to better understand and advance marine renewables. So if I'm giving a talk to a program on climate change, I figured it would be a good place to, uh, to start by having a computer that works. And it did before I had to start talking. Huh, that's interesting. Let's try this again. That's definitely not liking it. All right, let's see if this works. Good. The, uh, my, my computer turned to a screen of, of slides that had nothing but big red X's on it, so that seemed like a bad sign. OK, so uh, to start the talk today, I wanted to talk a little bit about why, you know, what's the motivation? What's the link between climate change and marine energy? And these are linked in two different ways. One is that we have increasing concern about the impacts of climate change, particularly on ocean ecosystems. And there's no silver bullet solution to climate change. You know, there's no way that we can produce enough power or use less power or you know, change population levels in such a way that we can basically get around this with one single solution. But part of that solution is almost certainly going to be a transition to a low carbon source of power generation. So moving away from natural gas, coal, gasoline, other sources of fossil generation, and towards more sustainable forms of generation. And the oceans are a potential source of sustainable power. So the oceans are both under threat from climate change and potentially part of the solution to climate change from a power generation standpoint. Now, marine renewable energy means different things to different people, and everyone has their own definition. Mine is relatively encompassing. Uh, so there's three types of marine renewable technology that I'm going to at least mention today. One is offshore wind energy. This is by far the most advanced of the marine renewables. It's been around in Europe uh, for at least the last decade. Uh, started with onshore wind turbines being brought into the marine environment in shallow water. Initially the thought was they would just have to be, uh, you know, take the same technology, move it offshore, put it on a pile, generate power, no changes required. Turns out salt spray actually goes a long way up in the air. And uh, the Horns Rev farm there, which you can see in the upper left, it's a 160 megawatt array. That's uh, 80 different turbines. Uh, within the first two years of operation, they needed to use helicopters to lift out every gearbox on that array because they'd all corroded. Um, since then, we've really perfected the, not perfected, but we've come a long way in advancing the technology used for power generation from offshore winds. Uh, the resource is the same as the terrestrial resource. You know, the wind blows, you have a turbine, it rotates, it generates power. But the offshore turbines are becoming increasingly large, now moving towards power generation capacities of 10 megawatts and greater. That's enough to power about 10,000 homes from a single turbine. Um, the blade span on some of these offshore turbines, greater than a 787 tip to tip. So these are huge devices in the offshore environment. And one of the pushes to go offshore is that there's fewer view said factors, right? You don't need to worry about someone saying, I don't like the way that looks if you're 20 miles offshore, because there's no one to see how it looks. The challenge, though, is that if you move further and further offshore, you move into deeper and deeper water, and it becomes difficult to really think about driving piles into the seabed when you're in, say, 200 meters of water. And so most of the innovation that we're seeing today is actually going on below the water surface. Things like the high wind tower here, which is a floating spar buoy, and the uh, wind float platform here that's proposed for demonstration on the U.S. West Coast, which is a, a semi-submersible stable platform. The idea here is that we're basically taking a proven technology that was proven onshore at scale, we're moving it into deeper water, we're moving it to larger uh, size turbines. So this is a relatively well-established technology. I won't spend too much time on this today. The type of technology that I spend most of my time working on looks a lot like a wind turbine underwater. And in fact, if you wanted to see exactly how bad my artistry is, I have a stick figure that shows a wind turbine underwater. But I don't need to show that these days because lots of people actually have commercial turbines in the water that are being tested. This is a technology that's a really advanced tremendously over the last five years. Uh, so we've gone from five years ago, devices on the drawing board, t turbines at kind of the 100 kilowatt scale. And in five years, we've gone to megawatt scale, utility scale machines. These have been deployed in various locations around the world. Many of them look a lot like a wind turbine. And one of the reasons the technology has advanced so quickly is because it can borrow very heavily from wind. Within the last two years, there's been major acquisitions in this space. So big multinational companies, Siemens, Lockheed, uh, Andritz Hydro, DCNS, big international companies have acquired these small tidal energy developers 
and are starting to think about how to deploy the technology at larger scale. Uh, so literally the technology is moving out of the garage and into the water. Now, that's not to say that everything looks like a three-bladed wind turbine. This one here looks a bit like uh, one of the old uh, egg beater designs for wind turbines that you might have seen 20 or 30 years ago. That's a technology that's been deployed in the US uh, and is a helical crossflow variant. So as the technologies, uh, you know, we can borrow a lot from wind, but when we think about what the technology will look like in the water, there's a lot of old ideas that are being tried again, and this is certainly one of them. And the realities in the water are a bit different uh, than the realities of wind, so maybe some of these uh, more novel concepts will have a place in the marine environment. The reason that we're interested in tidal energy is that it tends to be a very concentrated resource, a very intense resource, which is a challenge for all renewables. It's a, an intermittent resource, the tide ebbs, ebbs and it floods, but it's predictable. We can tend to tell when that resource is going to be available, and as a result, we can actually schedule power generation in a, a relatively more straightforward manner. The other type of technology that we deal with as a national center is wave energy. And you can see five different wave converters here of different capacities, different styles. Uh, this one basically flexes on the surface of the waves. This one, uh, the water fills a basin and drains out through a low head hydro turbine. This one hinges up and down. This one, I think it bobs up and down. This one flaps back and forth. <laughs> a lot of different ideas, right? And what I'm trying to show here is that unlike wind, which is fully converged to a three-bladed turbine, and tidal, which is headed towards some type of technology convergence, wave is, if anything, diverging. There are more technology concepts coming onto the market every year that look nothing like anything that's come before. And one of the reasons for that is that there's no terrestrial equivalent to wave energy. This is the idea of harnessing these relatively short period waves that are propagating across the ocean surface. They're intense, they're energetic, uh, but there's no terrestrial equivalent. And so as these technologies have been deployed, people have been thinking about for the first time how to really capture wave energy. Now, we can think about other types of marine renewables as well. We can think about exploiting thermal gradients between the surface of the ocean and, water, and depth. We could think about a tidal barrage, which would basically involve, say, building a dam across Puget Sound. But we're not going to talk a lot about that because I don't think anyone plans to build a dam across Puget Sound. We could talk about ocean current technologies, very similar to tidal, but deployed in places like the Gulf Stream. We could also talk about salinity gradients. That's trying to harness the power that's available when fresh water from a river mixes with the salt water in the ocean. But uh, we won't focus on all of those today. We'll mostly focus on wave and tidal and a little offshore wind. But marine renewable energy, lots of different technology options out there, all at relatively early stages of development, offshore wind accepted. OK, so what's the power generation landscape in the US look like today? The US is about 107,000 megawatts. That's enough to run over 100 million homes of coal-fired generation capacity has a similar amount of natural gas fire capacity, and that capacity for natural gas generation is increasing rapidly. We currently have about 60,000 megawatts of installed terrestrial wind capacity. We're adding this at a rapid rate as well, 13,000 megawatts added in 2012 alone. So wind, small but growing. The US currently supports zero megawatts of installed marine renewable energy generation capacity. So if marine renewables are really going to make a difference in the US, we've got a lot to go from here to there. So if we're going to get there, there's a couple of challenges in our way. And I'm going to frame this talk in terms of four challenges. I'm going to spend more time on one of them than the others, because this is a talk that is mostly focused on the environment. But I think it's important to take a relatively integrated systems approach to this problem. The first global challenge is shale gas. And the question here is, can marine renewable energy generation compete with electricity from shale gas? It's a simple question. Tough to answer. Here's a, uh, this is a hydraulic fracturing rig out in, um, in Pennsylvania. It's uh, producing natural gas. That natural gas is going to go and probably be burned in some sort of a combined cycle power plant, which is going to have a footprint that looks similar or smaller than this. So natural gas prices in the US have uh, been come down by a factor of three from their historic high in 2008, in large part because of the increase in hydraulic fracturing. Now, prior to 2008, the US was building lots of uh, natural gas terminals to import natural gas, import liquefied natural gas into the US, because we weren't going to have enough uh, domestic supply. As hydraulic fracturing has really taken off and the natural gas supply in the US has boomed, those terminals are now being repurposed to export natural gas around the world. 
So my expectation is that right now, natural gas prices are really low. It's really cheap to produce power from natural gas. But as the export capacity in the US ramps up, natural gas prices are going to become basically a global commodity similar to oil. And those prices are going to start coming back up. So I think you know, in terms of marine energy and renewable energy in general competing with shale gas, it's a question of, of time and the, the sort of global pressures on the markets for electricity. Now, one thing that we might think about for shale gas is that this is a pretty small footprint. There's not much to look at. There's not much hardware involved here. And one of the challenges for all renewable energies is that these have large visual footprints. They're trying to harness a relatively diffuse power and turn it into something useful. That's challenging, it takes a, it, and it can be visually intrusive to do. So what do the economics look like today? Well, combined cycle natural gas costs somewhere between $40 and $80 per megawatt hour. That's uh, a megawatt of electricity produced for an hour. Um, what the long-term projection for that is, anyone's guess. When I was starting grad school, I was told that no one in the US would ever build another combined cycle natural gas power plant because natural gas was too expensive. Now that's all we build. Another 10 years, maybe we'll be back to saying no one will ever build one again. So those uh, kind of non-renewable fuel prices tend to oscillate fairly wildly. Deep water offshore wind, currently more expensive, about a $100 to $300 per megawatt hour, but it's heading pretty rapidly into the territory where I think it's going to compete just fine with combined cycle natural gas. So we're not going to work about, worry about that too much today. Tidal current and wave energy. Currently much more expensive, order of magnitude more expensive than combined cycle natural gas. But people have argued that there is a pathway to get down to really kind of cost competitive levels through economies of scale. Of course, if there wasn't a way to get to these levels, then there's no reason to do this at all. So anytime you see energy economic analysis, the long run cost will always compete with whatever is the cheapest power available today. Um, and if that cost of that power goes up, the long run cost of those technologies tends to go up with it because you can kind of see this kind of oscillating end state for all these technologies. So take any energy economics with a bit of a grain of salt. So for the remainder of the talk, we're going to talk primarily about marine renewable energy in the context of tidal current and wave. And in that context, we go to our next global challenge, and that's proving system reliability. How can we tr prove that a turbine or a wave converter can reliably produce power over an N year period where N is something like 25 years when we only have maybe a year of operational data? So this is a picture of the one megawatt Alstom tidal turbine being mobilized in the Orkney Islands in Scotland. I had the pleasure of actually seeing this uh, when I was in the Orkneys, uh, I think it was last fall. And that one right there is its 500 kilowatt uh, predecessor, so they've gone done a 2x scale up in about a year on that technology. You can see the amount of equipment required to get this off the dock. You've got a big crane barge, and then when you go out to the site, you actually need to plug that into a socket uh, to start generating power. It's expensive to bring things in and out of the water. And so the overall economic viability of marine energy is really predicated on these devices working for a 20 to 25 year period and not requiring very much maintenance. So that's a tough target to meet. The longest, generate, the longest a marine energy system has been in the water to date is about four years. The shortest test lasted 24 hours when all the blades self-decommissioned. Um, so obviously, you know, 24 hours is way too short. Four years is getting close to the first maintenance cycle, but no one's been able to demonstrate a multi-year maintenance cycle yet. And that's one of the things we need to actually try to confront. So why is this a real global challenge? Why is this technically difficult? Well, when I first started working on marine energy, I went to a talk where the CTO of a tidal energy company that no longer exists, who had experience in the space program, stood up and said, I've worked in space. Marine energy is infinitely harder. And I was thinking, that seems like a little bit of exaggeration. I mean, it's really hard to go to space, right? But the longer I've worked on this, the more I'm starting to think that maybe he had something to, he was, you know, may have had a bit of a grain of truth there. And we think about going to space. It's in a vacuum, so pressures are really low and trying to rip everything apart. And it's really cold. The marine environment, pressures are really high. They're constantly trying to crush everything. The forces that are acting on these structures are really high. And rather than being in a medium that is basically kind of nothing, they're in a medium that's corrosive, electrically conductive, and is conducive to things growing on your structure that you really don't want to have there. I don't know. Maybe space is actually easier. So um, this, is one of, this is the reason that this is actually challenging, is that this is a really tough environment to do anything, much less do something for an extended period of time. So how are different people uh, trying to approach this? Well, 
many different engineering solutions to a single problem. And you can see that there's this kind of, this whole range I'd call a design philosophy spectrum. And on one end, you've got different developers, and I'll use Tidal Energy as an example, because I know most about it, but you can pull out different wave examples as well, where you have developers that are trying to develop technologies that are relatively low efficiency, but have extremely high mechanical simplicity. So this open hydro turbine, for example, it's rated at about a megawatt. Um, it has a single moving part. This internal cassette rotates, and when it rotates, it's spinning a generator that's out in the rim. There's no gearbox, there's no shaft coupling, there's no shaft seals. It's just a rotor and a direct drive generator. To deploy this, it go, it's a gravity foundation. You have a, a vessel that moves out uh, to where you want to drop it on the seabed. You lower it down. You can do the entire deployment within about a tidal cycle. Um, but it's relatively low efficiency. And so their argument is that the path to a really low cost of energy that can compete with combined cycle natural gas, which is where everyone wants to go, is that you have a system that's incredibly cheap to build and cheap to maintain, and you give up a little bit of the power generation potential. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got this device, which is the longest operating device in the world. It's a Siemens Marine Current Turbine C-Gen. Uh, it's been operating now for about five years in Strangford Lock of Northern Ireland. It's a design that's on the other end of the spectrum. Higher efficiency, almost 50% higher efficiency, on par with the best wind turbines that are on the market today, um, but it has much higher mechanical complexity. So it's got two blades on each of these arms. Each of these blades has a pitch control motor at the root, and the entire turbine can be lifted out of the water for maintenance. So it's got an integrated lifting mechanism. Each of these turbines has a, uh, a generator that's connected via a gearbox, and the installation of one of these devices takes about a month to maybe longer. And so if you look at this, this is basically saying that it's higher cost, higher mechanical complexity to get these in the water, but they're arguing that the integrated lift makes it cheaper to maintain, and the additional revenue from the higher efficiency is what's going to make them have the lowest cost of energy. Now, which end of this design philosophy spectrum wins out? Not sure. It's still an open question. No one's operated a turbine for more than four years yet, so when we get to 20 years, maybe we'll know. But the challenge is we need to figure out how things are going to operate in 20 years after we've run them for about a year. Okay, so that's an engineering challenge. How about a societal challenge? Well, a global social challenge that I view is the question of non-exclusionary use of the ocean. And the question here is, can marine renewable energy complement existing uses of the ocean or enable new uses? Does it have to be an either-or proposition? Right now, people tend to look at it in this way, right? You say, this area of the ocean can be used for fishing or it can be used for shipping. This area of the ocean can be used for marine renewables or it can be used for communications. This area can be used by the military or it can be used by marine renewables. It's an either-or, right? You don't say, well, we can use the ocean for many of these things. And probably we're going to have to think about using the ocean for many of these things. So I think that the exclusionary model of ocean use is probably not one that's going to stand up to increasing pressures, particularly uh, in the coastal ocean. There's virtually no place you can find that someone is not interested in that area. So for an example of offshore wind, the principal power project went and consulted with multiple people in Oregon and said, where's the best place to put this wind float offshore project? And after consulting with the crabbing industry and the shipping industry and the telecom industry, uh, they located, they found a location about 15 nautical miles offshore in 300 meters of water. Everyone said, yes, that's a great place to put it. And as soon as they filed their lease, another fishing fleet came through and said, you could not have found a worse place to put that. That's our prime fishing ground. So clearly, everyone has a stake in the ocean. And I think that it's important to think about how we can try to make better use of this in a, uh, I'd say, a more, a less exclusionary way, a more integrated manner. So one way that we're thinking about the societal influences on the ocean, and one of the reasons I think societal influences are really great, is that it gives us this opportunity to shape the evolution of the technology, not just from a technical and an economic perspective, but from a standpoint of what society is willing to accept. And so one of the projects we're working on now is uh, what's called sustainability of tidal energy. It's a, an NSF-funded um, project which is looking at how to integrate engineering, environmental, and societal considerations towards the design of marine energy systems. As we've gone through this project, we've found that outreach is critically important. In the absence of any sort of outreach and communication, people fill in their own conclusions. So for example, on the Washington coast, if you ask people how they feel about wave energy, they'd say, well, that's ridiculous. You know, we don't want a thousand of those tiny converters sitting off the coast. Because right now, the converters are all relatively early stage. And if you wanted to deploy, a large array of them to generate real power, you would need a 1,000 of these. 
but you'd never get financing to build a thousand tiny converters right now. No bank would look at you and say, you know, bank looks at you and said, how are you going to maintain those? What's your business plan? How, what, you know, what's prevent one from breaking off and washing ashore? And so when we think about what the technology is going to look like, it's important to, to think about that the technology is really still in a state of flux. It's not converged yet. Okay, so let's get to the, uh, the fourth question, and this is the one that we're going to spend most of our time on today, and that's the global environmental challenge of what I would call retiring risk. And we'll actually define what I mean by that as we go through this. And the question here is, can we prove whether or not marine energy development is going to have environmental impacts over an n-year period, where n is, say, 20 to 25 years, in much less than that time period? Especially if we're doing this against a, a background of climate change. So let me give you a scenario to explain why we have to try to solve this challenge. Right now, if we want to study the environmental effects of a tidal converter or a wave converter, we put it in the water, and if we're very lucky, five to 10 years down the road, we've learned something. So if our technology advancement is going to, say, put one converter in the water, study it for 10 years, figure out how it works, put another converter in the water, study it for 10 years, see how it works, somewhere around the next millennia, we'll actually have figured out what the technology looks like. And obviously, industry needs to advance at a somewhat faster rate than that, and climate change will have caught up to us by then. So we need to go a little bit faster. But how do we go faster? Well, the first question to ask is, what are we studying? And this is a, uh, a question of definitions that John Horn and I wrestled with uh, back in 2011 in an NSF workshop where we were kind of talking past each other on, on what we meant about impacts and changes. And so we finally said, you know, we should actually come up with a framework to try to describe what we're talking about here. So there's kind of four different categories of things that we can study. The first and most, uh, and I'd say least uh, impressive one is a stressor, which we define as an alteration to the environment by the installation, operation, or maintenance of a marine energy converter. Stressors comes in all shapes and sizes, right? You go to the shore of Puget Sound, you take a rock, you toss it into the water, you see ripples, they spread out, but actually ascribing any sort of environmental impact associated with that change, it's ephemeral. You can't do that. So not all stressors really rise to a level where they're worth worrying about. So when we think about what we want to study, the most the lowest level that we might want to study is something like what we call a change, which would be a detectable or measurable alteration to the environment, something that we can say, we did this, and it caused this change. Now, whether that change is significant or not, whether it's good or bad, that question is still on the table at this point. Now, if that change uh, really uh, kind of crosses a threshold and gets to the point where we think it's biologically significant, then we call it an effect. And whether a change is an effect depends on the site, depends on the project scale, Depends on a lot of different factors. Now, when we think about effects, effects can be negative, in which case we might think of them as an impact, or they can be positive. They can be a benefit. And we're saying, what do we want to study? We're thinking right now about studying changes when we're at an early stage so we can maximize this and minimize that. OK, that's the first question. The second question is, why should we study it? Or Perhaps a better way to phrase this from my standpoint is, what does a mechanical engineer care about environmental changes? Um, I'll answer that by the end of the talk. I think you'll agree the answer is that there's a really good reason. There's a fun reason to do it. So the first reason that people give for why we should study the environmental effects of marine energy is because there's a regulatory requirement that says you can't cause harm. They see the regulatory hammer. That's a reason to do research. It's not a really compelling reason to do research. It's not the reason I enjoy doing research. But OK, so it's motivation. That's the, uh, the stick. The carrot here, in my mind, or one part of it, is that if we actually study these things at the pilot scale, while we're small, if we can identify changes, maybe we can figure out ways to scale those up and figure out what the, effect, what the actual impacts will be at a commercial scale. So we can basically put the brakes on, these, on a project that maybe would have an impact before that impacts actually occurred. That's a somewhat more compelling reason to study these. As an engineer, the part that I find most interesting is that if we are able to identify these impacts while the technology is not yet converged, then maybe we can make design changes now that basically prevent those impacts from ever happening. So we still put the technologies in the water, we still generate sustainable power, but we don't cause environmental impacts. That's not an opportunity we get very often. Normally, technology goes through convergence. It's basically the technology is evolving. We get to something that costs the least, and we say, okay, this is what we want to deploy. And then we find out what the environmental impacts are, what the societal impacts are. Marine energy, by being un unconverged, has the opportunity 
to basically take some of that societal and environmental information and use it to shape convergence alongside economics. So we can't really you know, ignore one to the detriment of the other. Um, but for me, this is why this is interesting, is the possibility of preempting impact by engineering design. OK, so if we say kind of what we're studying and why we think it's a good idea to study, then the question becomes, what do we study? So this is a slide that one of my colleagues at Pacific Northwest National Lab, Simon Girloffs, put together. And it shows all the different things that can happen in the marine environment when you deploy things like wave converters and tidal turbines. And it's a pretty bewildering array, right? You know, you've got, you've got marine mammals that are diving down while the fish are being shocked by EMF, and there's a wake, and you know, then the, the fish are in a scour pit, and there, there's cables. And it, it's a mess, right? You know, you can look at this and you can probably construct thousands of possible pathways and you consider all the different stressors going on and all the different uh, receptors that are present in the environment. So obviously you're not going to study all of these things. So how do we actually try to figure out what the priorities are? Well, back in 2010, we, uh, we started, we convened a group of about, a, about 70 people, uh, experts from around the world with some information on the marine environment or marine energy, and tried to establish what the priorities would be. And so the outcome of that workshop was this stressor receptor matrix. So the stressors are aspects of device operation. These are things like, uh, for tidal energy, the presence of the device, the rotating blade, acoustic effects, electromagnetic fields. And the receptors are basically everything in the marine environment that might interact with those stressors. Now the way the workshop groups uh, looked at this question was they said, OK, take a, uh, a stressor and receptor how significant do you think this is going to be? So things that people felt were not likely to be significant got a green box. That's things like how sound is going to, say, affect sediment. We're pretty sure that's not something we need to worry about you know, relative to other things. But things like how a rotating blade interacts with migratory fish, that's probably something we care quite a bit about from the wind experience and the hydropower experience. Now we also ask people to say, what do we think our level of scientific uncertainty on these priorities are? Do we think that this is something we understand really well, or do we think it's something that we don't understand well at all? And we assign these three triangles. So a single green triangle means that we understand this pretty well. Four, three reds means we have really no understanding at all. And so you can see here, you know, things like sound and the near field environment. We're pretty sure that sound doesn't affect sediment, and it's not likely to affect water currents in a way that, that really matters. Things like the interaction of migratory fish with the device, that's something that could be really significant. But we really don't have very much data, at least we didn't back in 2010, to say whether this was actually significant or insignificant. And so this workshop report came out in 2011 and kind of laid out what the priority areas should be for studying pilot scale projects going forward. Now, you'll see there's a lot of red on this plot. There's a lot of uncertainties. A really well-designed pilot project probably studies about four of these boxes and does it well. So there's a need to really prioritize. So how do, how do we prioritize? Well, in my opinion, the first thing we say is that if you don't understand the individual stressor receptor interactions, the chances of understanding ecosystem interactions or cumulative effects are really low. So we probably don't want to make that a priority at the pilot scale. Energy removal, which is something that we really are concerned about with at the large scale for both wave and tidal, that's basically you know, the device intercepts a certain amount of energy and converts it to electricity, so it's not continuing on to its original destination. That can affect uh, sediment transport at shoreline. It can affect estuary and dynamics. Um, Mitsuhiro has done some very nice work explaining exactly how that can happen. But at the pilot scale, those changes are immeasurably small. They're like, you know, pitching the rock into the water of Puget Sound and trying to really tie back some sort of ecosystem change to that rock you threw. So that's probably not something to study right now. Electromagnetic effects and chemical effects, also at the pilot scale, the signal-to-noise ratio tends to be really low. There's some nice work being done at the national labs on electromagnetic effects. They basically put crabs in tanks. They expose them to extremely high levels of electromagnetic fields, and they see how their antenna twitch differently. Imagine doing that at the bottom of Admiralty Inlet around a tidal turbine. Probably not something we want to spend our time and effort doing. And then there's some things that are simply low priority, like sound and its effect on habitat. So that helps us to really narrow this down a little bit more to kind of the, the question of what I would say the static presence. This is the artificial reef effect and everything that can come with it. The dynamic effect for tidal, this is going to be things like blade strike. For wave, it's going to be things like entanglement and collision with converters. 
And then something that I think we can study at the pilot scale is sound. How does a sound produced by these devices affect the environment? Okay, before we get to the actual studies, let's do a, a, a quick digression. Is this something we should be studying or should we be trying to mitigate effects already? And so, ask the question, monitor changes or mitigate risks? The lesson from Strangford Lock, which sounds like a bad Sherlock Holmes novel. Um, so on the left here is a picture of the marine current turbine CGEN. Uh, this is a surface piercing tidal turbine. The uh, top part here contains all of its, uh, its service platform and electronics. Below the water surface, there's this pair of rotors on a cross arm. You can see them raised up here. It's operated in Northern Ireland since 2008. Uh, you can see it's driven into the seabed with a three meter diameter pile. Relatively large device occupies a lot of the water column. Now in Strangford Lock, back when CGEN was being commissioned in 2008, there was a lot of concern over exactly what would happen when harbor seals encountered this device. And there were, uh, there were three risk factors where people were really concerned about impacts. Now again, when you talk about impacts, that's a change that's crossed that threshold of biological significance. So people assumed that we'd, we'd be in the impact space immediately. And the reason for this was the activity of harbor seals in Strangford Lock they both forage and transit out to the Irish Sea. There's a, a beautiful study that was done uh, where they tagged all of these seals and basically created tracks and discovered that seals actually go most of the way across the Irish Sea, which they didn't expect. The scale of the project was important. There's actually a relatively large amount of the water column in the Strangford Lock that's swept by these rotor blades. And these rotor blades are moving at relatively high velocity, and there is the potential for seals to come in with, into contact with the tip. So there is a real mechanism there for risk to injury or mortality. So the conclusion for this was that we shouldn't be studying how the turbines interact with harbor seals. We should be mitigating that risk before, we, before the project goes in the water. And so the solution to this was a, a post-installation blade strike mitigation measure, which said, shut down the turbine when harbor seals are within X meters of the device. Okay. It's a strategy. There's two problems with this. How do you tell when a harbor seal is X meters away from a turbine? Well, after the, the regulators and the company had gotten done uh, deciding if this is what they were going to do, then the engineers got let loose on this problem. And the first stage of this was, we'll put an absor observer sitting on top of that pile, which is a pretty miserable place to be, and we'll put one on shore, and they'll be looking for harbor seals, and they'll have their hand on a big red button that shuts the turbine down. Now, we can only do this during daylight hours because the observers can't see the seals at night. So they operated like this for, uh, for I think, almost a year, and CGEN's nice in this regard. If you hit that big red button, those blades, they pitch to a neutral position and the turbine comes to a stop within about three seconds. So they started with, I think, a perimeter of about 150 meters. They moved back to 100 meters and they said, you know, it'd be really nice if we could operate the system at night. And so they started experimenting with active sonar to basically replace those, those uh, visual observers up on the pile and on the shoreline with an active sonar that's trying to see when a harbor seal is near the turbine. And that was implemented. And so now uh, they have an active sonar with someone staring at the output 24-7 with their hand on a big red button to shut the turbine down. And that went on uh, for a period of time where uh, you know, they basically said, OK, we're at 100 meters. They went to 50 meters. They went to 30 meters. And then someone asked the question, what's the risk to harbor seals? You know, you know, we obviously haven't killed any harbor seals, but so far we've learned that if you shut a turbine down and it's sitting idle in the water, it doesn't kill harbor seals, which I probably could have told you when we started the project. So the, uh, the developer went to the regulatory agency and said, we'd like to now operate the system when harbor seals go past and really see what happens. And the regulator said, oh, I think that's a really bad idea. And we said, well, why? You know, we've proven that you know, when they're 30 meters away, you know, the turbine shuts down, there's no problems. They said, well, yes, the harbor seals are now habituated. They think the turbine will shut down every time they're 30 meters away. So now they're at greater risk than they were when you put the thing in the water in the first place. So that gave the company a second thought, because now maybe the harbor seals are habituated. And let's say they run the experiment and they kill a harbor seal. Does that mean that the turbine itself is inherently risky? Or you had an habituated harbor seal that expected the turbine to shut down when it didn't? And so to my knowledge, they're still running on the shutdown routine. So that's why. I come down on the side of wanting to monitor rather than mitigate, because if you mitigate, you don't actually learn anything about how to go forward. Okay. So back in 2010, we established all these high priority areas, and since then, there have been multiple commercial demonstrations that have gone in the water in both the US and Europe, both for wave and tidal. 
Most of them have substantial monitoring programs. I said at this point, we probably spend upwards of $20 million on environmental monitoring for marine projects. What have we found? Uh, fish mortality for tidal turbines is infrequent. None has been observed to date. It doesn't mean it's not happening. It just means it's hard to observe. Um, we've discovered that marine energy converters produce sound. There's a lovely paper by a group in Sweden uh, that, honestly, through no fault of their own, concluded that when you bang metal plates together underwater, it's loud. Um, that had to do with failures of the technology and failures of their monitoring system. Okay. That's not really a surprising outcome. And we've discovered that if you put structures in the water, they get colonized. Barnacles like to grow on static structures. Anyone who's ever put a buoy in the water could have also told you that. So we've got all these high priority areas. Why are we reaching nothing really more than the obvious conclusions? Well, there's multiple reasons for this. One reason is that oftentimes when these converters have gone in the water, they've not operated long enough to do an environmental study. You put a system in the water, it operates for a few months, the environmental researchers say, great, we're ready to go, and then something breaks, and you don't do the study. The other problem uh, is in a European context, <laughs> there was, the strategy for adaptive management was deploy and monitor. We'll deploy these devices, we'll monitor the effects, and then we'll be able to say something about how we should proceed to the commercial scale. The problem is a couple of these projects never got past the deploy phase. They just deployed, and they didn't monitor. And now they said, well, we'd like to put more of them in the water. And the regulators say, well, what did you learn? They say, nothing. And the regulators said, well, that's not really good. Um, the other problem is that doing work around these projects turns to be in, out to be incredibly complicated. These are really harsh environments to be doing studies, even in the absence of marine energy. They're not well-studied areas. And we think about actually doing studies in these areas, it's really not much more, it's not much easier to put environmental instrumentation in the water than it is to actually put the converter in the water. And that's a real challenge, and I think that's one of the main limitations of, of why we don't know more than we do today. Okay, so where do we stand today? We're at a bit of a paradox. If environmental monitoring costs may uh, remain at their existing level of total project costs, and our timeline from basically from learning something to moving forward remains where it was, the industry will be crippled. But if early commercial projects cause environmental harm, the industry may also be crippled. So think about Altamont Pass for wind energy, right? You know, everyone knows that wind turbines kill birds. They don't really. It's mostly because of Altamont Pass. It was a wind site that was put up in a Raptor migration flyway. Many bird fatalities. Um, most modern wind turbines are, uh, are not really that bad for birds. But if we rush ahead, we have the risk of having an Altamont Pass for marine energy as well. So, how do we avoid impacts without incurring these really high costs? And this is something that was the subject of a recent workshop I worked with, with one of my collaborators with at PNNL. There's a webinar about it tomorrow morning if you'd like more information. So to think about how we get through here, one of the challenges is retiring risk. And when I say retiring risk, I mean this idea that often the objective of monitoring is to collect information that improves the certainty of evaluating a certain risk. And risk is the frequency of an interaction multiplied by its consequences, by its outcome. Ideally, over time, significant risks can be recognized. They can be mitigated through changes to converter design or optimization. In some cases, this means that we shouldn't put wave or tidal converters in certain places. In other cases, it means that a certain converter technology probably shouldn't go to market. Now, on the flip side, if we find that there are insignificant risks, these can be selectively retired from monitoring programs and allow us to focus on other things. The problem right now is that for the high priority risk, there's no agreed upon framework for reaching either of these end states. Right now we collect data, and the response is to collect more data. So we need to figure out some way to actually to nail down these questions well enough that we feel comfortable either saying, yes, this is a real risk, or no, it's not. Now that creates another challenge, and we're going to call this a data mortgage. Because the problem is the risks that are often of greatest concern are the ones with the lowest probability of occurrence. And so the fastest way to try to collect data about those is to conduct spatially comprehensive, temporally continuous monitoring. Basically, if you have a converter in the water, you run your sensors continuously, and you monitor the entire area around the converter. It's a collect everything strategy. The problem is that the data bandwidth associated with these strategies uh, results in something that is called a data mortgage in some circles. A data mortgage is basically accruing data faster than you can possibly process it. Now, we all do this in scientific research, right? We, you know, we put out a piece of instrumentation, we get it back three months later, then we, maybe we spend six months processing the data. But what if that data is coming in at a rate faster than we can ever really hope to process? So I'll give you an example. 
let's say we put out a stereo optical camera that's a, a two megapixel uh, pair of cameras running at 10 frames per second. That's going to be generating 80 megabytes of data per second of raw imagery. If we run three months of observations, that's 600 terabytes of storage required. That's one sensor covering one sector of a device. Very easily you get into big data territory. So there's two ways we might get around this. One is to, uh, to basically adopt instruments that intrinsically produce information. So rather than producing data that we then have to filter through, we basically get information about these environmental effects directly from the devices. Um, one example of this that comes pretty close are recording and transponding tags that we can attach to fish and marine mammals. The problem is these tend to be extremely expensive to deploy in large numbers. Another option is we have automated processing that mines all of that data that we collect and then extracts information and trashes what we don't need. Now, from my perspective as an engineer, this idea of this information, this instrumentation that produces information, that seems like that's pretty hard to achieve. And, and software seems like a, a really great solution. But is it really reasonable to expect that software is going to be some sort of silver bullet for all of our data mortgage problems? In the near term, probably not. So going back to that camera example, there's been a lot of work that's been done on automatic recognition and detection of fish in visual imagery. The problem is those systems tend to require high performance computing, they take time, and they're incredibly expensive to deploy. So the silver bullet for software, probably not there for all types of instruments. So one of the things that was discussed in this workshop was a better alternative might be integrated packages that basically can leverage the, the advantages of different pieces of instrumentation as an intermediate option between a pure hardware and a pure software solution. So let's take an example. Let's say we've got a marine energy converter, a mech, at the center of our slide here, and we want to detect, track, and identify a marine mammal that's on approach. So an approach that would incorporate an integrated package might be, let's say we start with this outer range where we have a passive acoustic detection system. We can probably try to detect and localize a marine mammal vocal in near real time. That's going to have omnidirectional detection at a range on the order of one kilometer. Localization is going to be tougher at that range. We're going to need to get a lot closer for that to work. But that's a system that maybe you know, we can detect that a marine mammal is present, and maybe that tells something that's a little more data intensive and a little harder to work with, like a split beam echo sounder, to turn on and start tracking that target. So something like a split beam echo sounder, again, we can process that data in near real time. We can track targets out to a range of 100 meters and closer. And then maybe once we're sure the target's getting really close, we turn on something that's really high bandwidth that we can't process easily like an optical camera, and we collect information right when that fish or marine mammal is right at the device. And that's a way that we might go do something of a more selective duty cycle. So rather than collecting information continuously and trying to, in post-process, using only that data stream to filter out what we want, maybe we can use all these different sensors working together to try to turn the high bandwidth ones on only when they're likely to record something. So that's the workshop outcome. Uh, I like to say we're a little ahead of the curve at UW. Uh, part of the reason is we were involved in the workshop, so we got to shape the outcome a little bit. But we've been thinking about something called an adaptable monitoring package, or an AMP. Um, I generally hate acronyms, but we're working with a utility on this project. Utilities love acronyms. They said, you need an acronym for this. I said, well, if we're doing a, a renewable energy project, we should pick an acronym that reminds us of power. I tried to get to Ampere, but it was a little too contrived, so give an AMP. This is a project I'm working on with some collaborators at APL, Andy Stewart, Ben Rush, and Paul Gibbs as well as one of my grad students, James Joslin. This is the AMP. So the AMP is an integrated package that can support many different types of instrumentation. So we've got stereo optical cameras, which are illuminated by a quartet of strobes. We've got an imaging sonar. We've got a smart hydrophone. We've got a cetacean click detector. That's all environmental monitoring. And then we've got things like a Doppler current profiler to look at turbulence and how that's interacting with devices. And we've got a Doppler velocimeter. And despite uh, Andy and Ben and Paul's desire to make this as small as possible, we keep preserving space so we can add more things down the road as we decide uh, we want to we want to add these in. So here's an example of an integrated package that we've already been developing. Now the problem with this integrated package is that you start looking at the data and power needs, and for a Doppler profiler, even at one hertz sampling, which is about as fast as you can drive one of these, the data bandwidth is actually really low. Imaging sonar is a little worse. The acoustic array is a little higher. Stereo optical really blows you through the roof. But to do species identification, you need something at that sort of bandwidth. So either imaging sonar or optical imagery. So this basically drives you toward the need to have a cabled connection to shore. 
which is really hard to do in these wave and current environments, right? I mean, it's it's tough. This is it's high energy tides, high energy high energy currents, high energy waves. So trying to deploy one of these packages with its own cable is really tough. So we need a cable, but fortunately, the marine energy converter also needs a cable to shore. So what if we were to integrate some of these packages themselves with the converter? What might that look like? Well, here's a picture of an open hydro turbine, a six meter variant, with the amp installed on this cantilever sticking off the turbine. So the amp is able to make use of the power and data cables that go back to shore uh, that are combined with the, uh, that, are com that are basically used to, to take that power back to the shore station. And that gives us both the, uh, the data bandwidth we need to run the monitoring mission and the power to run those sensors. Okay, so that's great. But let's say we want to put a new sensor in. Let's say we have a sensor failure and we, or we want to change the monitoring mission or we learn something about how fish are interacting with the rotor and now we want to see how they're aggregating so we want to turn this thing. Well, one option is just bring the whole converter back to the surface. That's about a million dollar operation and it's not exactly low risk. So that's probably not a good idea. So we need to figure out some way to actually get this back and still have it be able to connect uh, down into the turbine uh, without actually bringing the whole thing back to the surface. Okay, so we've been thinking about that as well. And this is a system we've come up with. So the system you're seeing here, the amp is in the center here, and we have a deployment system that is going to basically latch this onto a docking station on the turbine. It uses a wet mate uh, power and fiber connector. It's exactly what's being used for the regional scale nodes project. So this is a marine energy project, but it's also something of a, an ocean observing project. We're basically turning a tidal turbine into an ocean observatory. And the way the system is deployed is with a, an off-the-shelf inspection class ROV, a Saab CI Falcon. And then we have this customized tool skid that has additional thrusters for thrust augmentation, as well as the, uh, the hardware for actually latching this whole system in place in the docking station. The custom skid is being developed in conjunction with Seaview Systems. So we had to come up with a name for this skid. I suggested Albatross and was immediately shut down. Um, I then suggested Shoebill. No one knew what a Shoebill looked like. Um, and then James said, why don't we call it the Millennium? Because, you know, the Millennium Falcon, that'd be a really cool name for this whole system. I said, that is ridiculous. We cannot name a system the Millennium Falcon. So I talked to one of my colleagues at APL, and his advice was, you have an opportunity to name a system the Millennium Falcon, call it the Millennium Falcon. So we have a Millennium Falcon now, and this has been a really interesting systems engineering problem because we need to minimize the drag on this system during deployment and during operation. Um, we need to have the, the amp needs to survive long term. This needs to be relatively cheap. We've gone through CFD, corrosion analysis, stress analysis, uh, trying to think about the whole monitoring mission about what this system looks like. And we've got, a, I think, a pretty good system that we've put together here. So we've got our Millennium Falcon being launched from uh, this platform here for deployment. We have an umbilical black to a surface vessel. And in deployment, we basically fly the Millennium Falcon and dock it with the turbine. At sea flight tests are hopefully going to start in the fall of 2014. The Millennium Falcon right now is uh, is parts on a bench in my lab. Um, so I asked the question, why would an engineer care about environmental changes? I mean, what engineer doesn't want to pilot the Millennium Falcon towards a tidal turbine? So I think that's a pretty a pretty easy question to answer. Okay. So in conclusion. I think marine renewable energy has significant potential, but to get there, it's going to have to overcome a number of significant challenges. And to get there is going to require a coupled engineering, environmental, societal, and economic approach. We're not going to be able to simply focus on the engineering aspects and ignore everything else any more than we could simply focus on the societal issues and ignore everything else. And to do that, we need broad collaborations between researchers, it has to be multidisciplinary research, industry, regulators, and the public. So I think we're going to get there. I think it's a matter of time. Um, and I'm really thankful for all the people we have at UW that are working on trying to move us in that direction. So that's it. This talk is supported by a number of different groups. If you're interested, there's a DOE webinar tomorrow morning. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Oh, great. Okay, good. I was thinking, oh, we've got to do the whole talk again. It wasn't on, I wasn't mic'd. Yes. <laughs>
the intention is if the Open Hydro project moves forward, so right now there's a proposal to deploy two Open Hydro turbines in Northern Admiralty Inlet. The question is whether we'll have a chance to deploy the system with it. Um, if that project moves forward, then yes, the, the AMP and its monitoring systems are an integral part of the environmental monitoring plans for that project. If that project doesn't move forward for whatever reason, uh, we're looking at this as an asset for the overall Pacific Marine Energy Center. That's a basically a consortium of test facilities for both wave and tidal current systems. So we see this as a platform that can be used for multiple projects. So the question is, um, can wave energy converters be used to protect, co protect coasts from future hazards? And the answer to that is there is actually projects on the drawing board right now designed exactly to do that, where wave converters are being inserted into breakwaters as a way to basically reduce the stresses on the breakwater and generate power. Um, so people are definitely thinking in that direction. Uh, people have thought about using wave converters as a way to protect offshore wind turbines uh, from really strong storms. Um, Mitsuhiro and I also had a thought about using tidal turbines to try to offset sea level rise in Puget Sound. But that's we're getting to the point of being getting to geotechnical engineering there, and that's a long ways off. So there are ways that you can think about trying to, to really make this a, an integrated solution to that problem, though. So great question. So the question is, what fraction of the energy do converters take out of a tidal environment? Um, and the answer to that depends on the converter technology and it's on, its, on its packing and spacing. So an individual converter has an efficiency. It can harness somewhere upwards of 50% of the kinetic flux that passes through its swept area. Now, when you think about an array of converters, and you know, so you have multiple rows, and you say, what's the ultimate carrying capacity of a system? That really depends on the dynamics of the estuary. So if you, there's a nice, there's kind of a classic curve of basically reduction in tidal range versus power generation potential. And it, it's basically a curve that hits, you kind of, you keep going, you keep dropping the tidal range, you keep generating more power, and eventually you get to a turning point where you put more turbines in the system and you actually get less power out because you've slowed the flow down. And that tipping point there is called the theoretical resource. You can never get to the theoretical resource because around the time you're getting close to that, you have to put a huge amount of infrastructure in the water to get just a little bit more power. And so the, the technical limit is probably about 75% of the theoretical resource, which for a place like Puget Sound is about 300 megawatts of average generation capacity-ish. Yes? So there, there has been limited attempts to make a direct discussion. Of that. The question is, how do you trade off the, the benefits of renewable generation against the, in terms of the, the health of an ecosystem against the, the stressors that are associated with power generation from that ecosystem? And there has been a discussion that started on that. There's a paper that's out in conservation biology that looks at trying to address that question. Um, the problem has been that the level of uncertainty around the environmental changes for tidal and wave energy somewhat precludes having that conversation. Because if we say, well, we could have, you know, so tidal turbines might harm a lot of fish or they might harm no fish, right? That's, that's really hard to make any sort of a policy decision or have a scientific discussion at that point. I think we're moving in the direction of being able to have that discussion, but I think we're at least five years out from having enough information to, to say that with a, what we would call a useful bound on the uncertainty. So, that's some place we all want to get. Getting there is another question entirely. So the question is, what's been done on the biofouling question in the environments, and how do you get to a 20-year service life when biofouling is a concern? Um, so to date, projects have basically adopted what we do for the, any sort of a vessel in the water, right? Use anti-fouling paints, use something with a copper biocide um, on the structures that you actually care about. So say on the active structures of a system. So for a tidal turbine, 
maybe you wouldn't coat the foundation because it's not really an active part of power generation, but you put a coating on the blades. Long term, no one really wants to stick with that sort of kind of diffuse toxicity. And so there's definitely work on inert anti-fouling measures that could replace those. We tested one out in Admiralty Inlet over the last 18 months and came out of the water looking about the condition it did when it went in. Um, so there are options. Right now the problem is that those options are all more expensive than the alternative and because economics drives this, we basically need to get the cost of those systems down. There's some great work in chemistry uh, going on uh, with Zwitter ionic uh, compounds that are, are really inherently anti-fouling. Right now, the economics of them are such that you can afford them only for medical implants. As the cost comes down, I see them being taken up by things like international shipping. As the cost comes down further, I see them being taken up by marine energy. Oftentimes, marine energy is going to be the last adopter for some of these newest technologies because they can afford to pay the least for them.